Section seventeen of Germanal by Emile Zola, translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part four, chapter one. On that Monday, the Ambos had invited the Gregoires and their daughter Cecile to lunch. They had formed their plans on rising from table paul negrel was to take the ladies to a mine san thomas which had been luxuriously reinstalled but this was only an amiable pretext this party was an invention of madame Ambeau's to hasten the marriage of cecile and paul suddenly on this very monday at four o'clock in the morning the strike broke out when on the first of december the company had adopted the new wage system the miners remained calm at the end of the fortnight not one made the least protest on payday everybody from the manager down to the last overseer considered the tariff as accepted and great was their surprise in the morning at this declaration of war made with a tactical unity which seemed to indicate energetic leadership at five o'clock Dancer woke m Rambaud to inform him that not a single man had gone down at the voreau the settlement of the deux cent quarante which he had passed through was sleeping deeply with closed windows and doors and as soon as the manager had jumped out of bed his eyes still swollen with sleep he was overwhelmed every quarter of an hour messengers came in and dispatches fell on his desk as thick as hail at first he hoped that the revolt was limited to the voreau but the news became more serious every minute there was the Mirol, the crevecourt the madeleine where only the grooms had appeared the victoire and foutre cantel the two best discipline pits where the men had been reduced by a third st thomas alone numbered all its people and seemed to be outside the movement up to nine o'clock he dictated dispatches telegraphing in all directions to the prefect of lille to the directors of the company warning the authorities and asking for orders he had sent negrel to go round the neighbouring pits to obtain precise information suddenly m hombeau recollected the lunch and he was about to send the coachman to tell the gregoires that the party had been put off when a certain hesitation and lack of will stopped him the man who in a few brief phrases had just made military preparations for a field of battle he went up to madame Hombeau, whose hair had just been done by her lady's maid in her dressing-room ah they are on strike she said quietly when he had told her well what has that to do with us we are not going to leave off eating i suppose and she was obstinate it was vain to tell her that the lunch would be disturbed and that the visit to st thomas could not take place she found an answer to everything why lose a lunch that was already cooking and as to visiting the pit they could give that up afterwards if the walk was really imprudent besides she added when the maid had gone out you know that i am anxious to receive these good people this marriage ought to affect you more than the follies of your men i want to have it don't contradict me he looked at her agitated by a slight trembling and the hard firm face of the man of discipline expressed the secret grief of a wounded heart she had remained with naked shoulders already over mature but still imposing and desirable with a broad bust of a series gilded by the autumn for a moment he felt a brutal desire to seize her and to roll his head between the breasts she was exposing in this warm room which exhibited the private luxury of a sensual woman and had about it an irritating perfume of musk but he recoiled for ten years they had occupied separate rooms good he said leaving her do not make any alterations m Hombeau had been born in the ardennes in his early life he had undergone the hardships of a poor boy thrown as an orphan on the paris streets after having painfully followed the courses of the ecole de mines at the age of twenty-four he had gone to the grand com as engineer to the saint barbe mine 
three years later he became divisional engineer of the pas de calais at the marle mines it was there that he married wedding by one of those strokes of fortune which are the rule among the corps de mines the daughter of the rich owner of a spinning factory at arras for fifteen years they lived in the same small provincial town and no event broke the monotony of existence not even the birth of a child an increasing irritation detached madame Hombeau, who had been brought up to respect money and was disdainful of this husband who gained a small salary with such difficulty and who enabled her to gratify none of the satisfactions of vanity which she had dreamed of at school he was a man of strict honesty who never speculated but stood at his post like a soldier the lack of harmony had only increased aggravated by one of those curious misunderstandings of the flesh which freezes the most ardent he adored his wife she had the sensuality of a greedy blonde and already they slept apart ill at ease and wounded from that time she had a lover of whom he was ignorant at last he left the pas de calais to occupy a situation in an office at paris with the idea that she would be grateful to him but paris only completed their separation that paris which she had desired since her first doll and where she washed away her provincialism in a week becoming a woman of fashion at once and throwing herself into all the luxurious follies of the period the ten years which she spent there were filled by a great passion a public intrigue with a man whose desertion nearly killed her this time the husband had not been able to keep his ignorance and after some abominable scenes he resigned himself disarmed by the quiet unconscious of this woman who took her happiness where she found it it was after the rupture and when he saw that she was ill with grief that he had accepted the management of the monceau mines still hoping also that she would reform down there in that desolate black country the Ambos, since they had lived at monceau returned to the irritated boredom of their early married days at first she seemed consoled by the great quiet soothed by the flat monotony of the immense plain she buried herself in it as a woman who has done with the world she affected a dead heart so detached from life that she did not even mind growing stout then beneath this indifference a final fever declared itself the need to live once more and she deluded herself for six months by organizing and furnishing to her taste the little villa belonging to the management she said it was frightful and filled it with upholstery bric-a-brac and all sorts of artistic luxuries which were talked of as far as little now the country exasperated her those stupid fields spread out to infinity those eternal black roads without a tree swarming with a horrid population which disgusted and frightened her complaints of exile began she accused her husband of having sacrificed her to a salary of forty thousand francs a trifle which hardly sufficed to keep the house up why could he not imitate others demand a part for himself obtain shares succeed in something at last and she insisted with the cruelty of an heiress who had brought her own fortune he always restrained and taking refuge in the deceptive coldness of a man of business was torn by desire for this creature one of those late desires which are so violent and which increase with age he had never possessed her as a lover he was haunted by a continual image to have her once to himself as she had given herself to another every morning he dreamed of winning her in the evening then when she looked at him with her cold eyes and when he felt that everything within her denied itself to him he avoided touching her hand it was a suffering without possible cure hidden beneath the stiffness of his attitude the suffering of a tender nature in secret anguish at the lack of domestic happiness at the end of six months when the house being definitely furnished no longer occupied madame Hombeau, she fell into the languor of boredom a victim who was being killed by exile and who said that she was glad to die of it just then paul Negrel arrived at monceau his mother the widow of a provence captain living at avignon on a slender income 
had had to content herself with bread and water to enable him to reach the ecole polytechnique he had come out low in rank and his uncle m had enabled him to leave by offering to take him as engineer at the bureau from that time he was treated as one of the family he even had his room there his meals there lived there and was thus enabled to send to his mother half his salary of three thousand francs to disguise this kindness m hennebeau spoke of the embarrassment to a young man of setting up a household in one of those little villas reserved for the mine engineers madame hennebeau had at once taken the part of a good aunt treating her nephew with familiarity and watching over his comfort during the first months especially she exhibited an overwhelming maternity with her advice regarding the smallest subjects but she remained a woman however and slid into personal confidences this lad so young and so practical with his unscrupulous intelligence professing a philosopher's theory of love amused her with the vivacity of the pessimism which had sharpened his thin face and pointed nose one evening he naturally found himself in her arms and she seemed to give herself up out of kindness while saying to him that she had no heart left and wished only to be his friend in fact she was not jealous she joked him about the putters whom he declared to be abominable and she almost sulked because he had no young man's pranks to narrate to her then she was carried away by the idea of getting him married she dreamed of sacrificing herself and of finding a rich girl for him their relations continued a plaything a recreation in which she felt the last tenderness of a lazy woman who had done with the world two years had passed by one night m hennebeau had a suspicion when he heard naked feet passing his door but this new adventure revolted him in his own house between this mother and this son and besides on the following day his wife spoke to him about the choice of cecile gregoire which she had made for her nephew she occupied herself over this marriage with such ardour that he blushed at his own monstrous imagination he only felt gratitude towards the young man who since his arrival had made the house less melancholy as he came down from the dressing-room m hennebeau found that paul who had just returned was in the vestibule he seemed to be quite amused by the story of this strike well asked his uncle well i've been round the settlements they seem to be quite sensible in there i think they will first send you a deputation but at that moment madame hennebeau's voice called from the first story is that you paul come up then and tell me the news how queer they are to make such a fuss these people who are so happy and the manager had to renounce further information since his wife had taken his messenger he returned and sat before his desk on which a new packet of dispatches was placed at eleven o'clock the gregoires arrived and were astonished when hippolyte the footman who was placed as sentinel hustled them in after an anxious glance at the two ends of the road the drawing-room curtains were drawn and they were taken at once into the study where m hennebeau apologized for their reception but the drawing-room looked over the street and it was undesirable to seem to offer provocations what you don't know he went on seeing their surprise m grégoire when he heard that the strike had at last broken out shrugged his shoulders in his placid way bah it would be nothing the people were honest with a movement of her chin madame grégoire approved his confidence and the everlasting resignation of the colliers while cecile who was very cheerful that day feeling that she looked well in her capuchin cloth costume smiled at the word strike which reminded her of visits to the settlements and the distribution of charities madame hennebeau now appeared in black silk followed by negrel ah isn't it annoying she said at the door as if they couldn't wait those men you know that paul refuses to take us to st thomas we can stay here said m grégoire obligingly we shall be quite pleased paul had contented himself with formally saluting cecile and her mother 
angry at this lack of demonstrativeness his aunt sent him with a look to the young girl and when she heard them laughing together she enveloped them in a maternal glance monsieur hennebeau however finished reading his dispatches and prepared a few replies they talked near him the wife explained that she had not done anything to this study which in fact retained its faded old red paper its heavy mahogany furniture its cardboard files scratched by use three-quarters of an hour passed and they were about to seat themselves at table when the footman announced m Danalon. he entered in an excited way and bowed to madame Hennebeau. ah you here he said seeing the gregoires and he quickly spoke to the manager it has come then i've just heard of it through my engineer with me all the men went down this morning but the thing may spread i'm not at all at ease how is it with you he had arrived on horseback and his anxiety betrayed itself in his loud speech and abrupt gestures which made him resemble a retired cavalry officer m hennebeau was beginning to inform him regarding the precise situation when hippolyte opened the dining-room door then he interrupted himself to say lunch with us i will tell you more dessert yes as you please replied Danilin, so full of his thoughts that he accepted without ceremony he was however conscious of his impoliteness and turned towards madame hennebeau with apologies she was very charming however when she had had a seventh plate laid she placed her guests madame grégoire and cecile by her husband then m grégoire and deneulin at her own right and left then paul whom she put between the young girl and her father as they attacked the hors d'oeuvres she said with a smile you must excuse me i wanted to give you oysters on monday you know there was an arrival of austin oysters at marchand's and i meant to send the cook with the carriage but she was afraid of being stoned they all interrupted her with a great burst of gaiety they thought the story very funny hush said m hennebeau vexed looking at the window through which the road could be seen we need not tell the whole country that we have company this morning well here is a slice of sausage which they shan't have m grégoire declared the laughter began again but with greater restraint each guest made himself comfortable in this room upholstered with flemish tapestry and furnished with old oak chests the silver shone behind the panes of the sideboards and there was a large hanging lamp of red copper whose polished surfaces reflected a palm and an aspidistra growing in majolica pots outside the december day was frozen by a keen northeast wind but not a breath of it entered a greenhouse warmth developed the delicate odor of the pineapple sliced in a crystal bowl suppose we were to draw the curtains proposed negrel who was amused at the idea of frightening the gregoires the housemaid who was helping the footman treated this as an order and went and closed one of the curtains this led to interminable jokes not a glass or a plate could be put down without precaution every dish was hailed as a waif escaped from the pillage in a conquered town and behind this forced gaiety there was a certain fear which betrayed itself in involuntary glances towards the road as though a band of starvelings were watching the table from outside after the scrambled eggs with truffles trout came on the conversation then turned to the industrial crisis which had become aggravated during the last eighteen months it was inevitable said Denelon. the excessive prosperity of recent years was bound to bring us to it think of the enormous capital which has been sunk the railways harbors and canals all the money buried in the maddest speculations among us alone sugar works have been set up as if the department could furnish three beetroot harvests good heavens and to-day money is scarce and we have to wait to catch up the interests of the expended millions so there is a mortal congestion and a final stagnation of business m hennebeau disputed this theory but he agreed that the fortunate years had spoilt the men when i think 
he exclaimed that these chaps in our pits used to gain six francs a day double what they gain now and they lived well too and acquired luxurious tastes to-day naturally it seems hard to them to go back to their old frugality monsieur grégoire interrupted madame hennebeau let me persuade you a little more trout they are delicious are they not the manager went on but as a matter of fact is it our fault we too are cruelly struck since the factories have closed one by one we have had a deuce of a difficulty in getting rid of our stock and in face of the growing reduction in demand we have been forced to lower our net prices it is just this that the men won't understand there was silence the footman presented roast partridge while the housemaid began to pour out chamotin for the guests there has been a famine in india said deneron in a low voice as though he were speaking to himself america by ceasing to order iron has struck a heavy blow at our furnaces everything holds together a distant shock is enough to disturb the world and the empire which was so proud of this hot fever of industry he attacked his partridge wing then raising his voice the worst is that to lower the net prices we ought logically to produce more otherwise the reduction bears on wages and the worker is right in saying that he has to pay the damage this confession the outcome of his frankness raised a discussion the ladies were not at all interested besides all were occupied with their plates in the first zest of appetite when the footman came back he seemed about to speak then he hesitated what is it asked m hennebeau if there are letters give them to me i am expecting replies no sir it is m dansard who is in the hall but he doesn't wish to disturb you the manager excused himself and had the head captain brought in the latter stood upright a few paces from the table while all turned to look at him huge out of breath with the news he was bringing the settlements were quiet only it had now been decided to send a deputation it would perhaps be there in a few minutes very well thank you said monsieur hennebeau i want a report morning and evening you understand and as soon as dansard had gone they began to joke again and hastened to attack the russian salad declaring that not a moment was to be lost if they wished to finish it the mirth was unbounded when Negrel, having asked the housemaid for bread, she replied, Yes, sir, in a voice as low and terrified as if she had behind her a troop ready for murder and rape. You may speak, said Madame Hennebeau complacently. They are not here yet. The manager, who now received a packet of letters and dispatches, wished to read one of his letters aloud. It was from Perron who in respectful phrases gave notice that he was obliged to go out on strike with his comrades in order to avoid ill-treatment and he added that he had not even been able to avoid taking part in the deputation although he blamed that step so much for liberty of work exclaimed m hennebeau then they returned to the strike and asked him his opinion oh he replied we have had them before it will be a week or at most a fortnight of idleness as it was last time they will go and wallow in the public houses and then when they are hungry they will go back to the pits deneulin shook his head i'm not so satisfied this time they appear to be better organized have they not a provident fund yes scarcely three thousand francs what do you think they can do with that i suspect a man called etienne lantier of being their leader he is a good workman it would vex me to have to give him his certificate back as we did of old to the famous rasseneur who still poisons the voreux with his ideas and his beer no matter in a week half the men will have gone down and in a fortnight the ten thousand will be below he was convinced his only anxiety was concerning his own possible disgrace should the directors put the responsibility of the strike on him for some time he had felt that he was diminishing in favour 
so leaving the spoonful of russian salad which he had taken he read over again the dispatches received from paris endeavouring to penetrate every word his guests excused him the meal was becoming a military lunch eaten on the field of battle before the first shots were fired the ladies then joined in the conversation madame gregoire expressed pity for the poor people who would suffer from hunger and cecile was already making plans for distributing gifts of bread and meat but madame hennebeau was astonished at hearing of the wretchedness of the Mossos colliers were they not very fortunate people who were lodged and warmed and cared for at the expense of the company in her indifference for the herd she only knew the lesson she had learnt and with which she had surprised the parisians who came on a visit she believed them at last and was indignant at the ingratitude of the people Negro, meanwhile continued to frighten m grégoire cecile did not displease him and he was quite willing to marry her to be agreeable to his aunt but he showed no amorous fever like a youth of experience who he said was not easily carried away now he professed to be a republican which did not prevent him from treating his men with extreme severity or from making fun of them in the company of the ladies nor have i my uncle's optimism either he continued i fear there will be serious disturbances so i should advise you monsieur grégoire to lock up piolaine they may pillage you just then still retaining the smile which illuminated his good-natured face m grégoire was going beyond his wife in paternal sentiments with regard to the miners pillage me he cried stupefied and why pillage me are you not a shareholder in monceau you do nothing you live on the work of others in fact you are an infamous capitalist and that is enough you may be sure that if the revolution triumphs it will force you to restore your fortune as stolen money at once he lost his childlike tranquillity his serene unconsciousness he stammered stolen money my fortune did not my great-grandfather gain and hardly too the sum originally invested have we not run all the risks of the enterprise and do i to-day make a bad use of my income madame Hombeau, alarmed at seeing the mother and daughter also white with fear hastened to intervene saying paul is joking my dear sir but m grégoire was carried out of himself as the servant was passing round the crayfish he took three of them without knowing what he was doing and began to break their claws with his teeth ah i don't say but what there are shareholders who abuse their position for instance i have been told that ministers have received shares in monceau for services rendered to the company it is like a nobleman whom i will not name a duke the biggest of our shareholders whose life is a scandal of prodigality millions thrown into the street on women feasting and useless luxury but we who live quietly like good citizens as we are who do not speculate who are content to live wholesomely on what we have giving a part to the poor come now your men must be mere brigands if they came and stole a pin from us negrel himself had to calm him though amused at his anger the crayfish were still going round the little crackling sound of their carapaces could be heard while the conversation turned to politics m grégoire in spite of everything and though still trembling called himself a liberal and regretted louis philippe as for Denalon, he was for a strong government he declared that the emperor was gliding down the slope of dangerous concessions remember eighty nine he said it was the nobility who made the revolution possible by their complicity and taste for philosophic novelties very well the middle class to-day are playing the same silly game with their furious liberalism their rage for destruction their flattery of the people yes yes you are sharpening the teeth of the monster that will devour us it will devour us rest assured the ladies bade him be silent and tried to change the conversation by asking him news of his daughters lucy was at marchand where she was singing with a friend 
john was painting an old beggar's head but he said these things in a distracted way he constantly looked at the manager who was absorbed in the reading of his dispatches and forgetful of his guests behind those thin leaves he felt paris and the director's orders which would decide the strike at last he could not help yielding to his preoccupation well what are you going to do he asked suddenly m hennebeau started then turned off the question with a vague phrase we shall see no doubt you are solidly placed you can wait deneulin began to think aloud but as for me i shall be done for it if the strike reaches vandame i shall have reinstated jean bart in vain with a single pit i can only get along by constant production ah i am not in a very pleasant situation i can assure you this involuntary confession seemed to strike m hennebeau he listened and a plan formed within him in case the strike turned out badly why not utilize it by letting things run down until his neighbor was ruined and then buy up his concession at a low price that would be the surest way of regaining the good graces of the directors who for years had dreamed of possessing van damme if jean bart bothers you as much as that said he laughing why don't you give it up to us but deneulin was already regretting his complaints he exclaimed never never they were amused at his vigour and had already forgotten the strike by the time the dessert appeared an apple charlotte meringue was overwhelmed with praise afterwards the ladies discussed a recipe with respect to the pineapple which was declared equally exquisite the grapes and pears completed their happy abandonment at the end of this copious lunch all talked excitedly at the same time while the servant poured out rhine wine in place of champagne which was looked upon as commonplace and the marriage of paul and cecile certainly made a forward step in the sympathy produced by the dessert his aunt had thrown such urgent looks in his direction that the young man showed himself very amiable and in his wheedling way reconquered the Grégoires, who had been cast down by his stories of pillage for a moment m hennebeau seeing the close understanding between his wife and his nephew felt that abominable suspicion again revive as if in this exchange of looks he had surprised a physical contact but again the idea of the marriage made here before his face reassured him hippolyte was serving the coffee when the housemaid entered in a fright sir sir they are here it was the delegates doors banged a breath of terror was passing through the neighbouring rooms around the table the guests were looking at one another with uneasy indecision there was silence then they tried to resume their jokes they pretended to put the rest of the sugar in their pockets and talked of hiding the plate but the manager remained grave and the laughter fell and their voices sank to a whisper while the heavy feet of the delegates who were being shown in tramped over the carpet of the next room madame hennebeau said to her husband lowering her voice i hope you will drink your coffee certainly he replied let them wait he was nervous listening to every sound though apparently occupied with his cup paul and cecile got up and he made her venture an eye to the keyhole they were stifling their laughter and talking in a low voice do you see them yes i see a big man and two small ones behind haven't they ugly faces not at all they are very nice suddenly m hennebeau left his chair saying the coffee was too hot and he would drink it afterwards as he went out he put a finger to his lips to recommend prudence they all sat down again and remained at the table in silence no longer daring to move listening from afar with intent ears jarred by these coarse male voices End of section seventeen section eighteen of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part four chapter two the previous day at a meeting held at rasseneur's 
etienne and some comrades had chosen the delegates who were to proceed on the following day to the manager's house when in the evening maheude learned that her man was one of them she was in despair and asked him if he wanted them to be thrown on the street maheu himself had agreed with reluctance both of them when the moment of action came in spite of the injustice of their wretchedness fell back on the resignation of their race trembling before the morrow preferring still to bend their backs to the yoke in the management of affairs he usually gave way to his wife whose advice was sound this time however he grew angry at last all the more so since he secretly shared her fears just leave me alone will you he said going to bed and turning his back a fine thing to leave the mates now i'm doing my duty she went to bed in her turn neither of them spoke then after a long silence she replied you're right go only poor old man we are done for midday struck while they were at lunch for the rendezvous was at one o'clock at the advantage from which they were to go together to m hombeau's they were eating potatoes as there was only a small morsel of butter left no one touched it they would have bread and butter in the evening you know that we reckon on you to speak said etienne suddenly to maheu the latter was so overcome that he was silent from emotion no no that's too much cried maheude i am quite willing he should go there but i don't allow him to go at the head why him more than any one else then etienne with his fiery eloquence began to explain maheu was the best worker in the pit the most liked and the most respected whose good sense was always spoken of in his mouth the miners claims would carry decisive weight at first etienne had arranged to speak but he had been at montsou for too short a time one who belonged to the country would be better listened to in fact the comrades were confiding their interests to the most worthy he could not refuse it would be cowardly maheude made a gesture of despair go go my man go and be killed for the others i'm willing after all but i could never do it stammered maheu i should say something stupid etienne glad to have persuaded him struck him on the shoulder say what you feel and you won't go wrong father bonmort whose legs were now less swollen was listening with his mouth full shaking his head there was silence when potatoes were being eaten the children were subdued and behaved well then having swallowed his mouthful the old man muttered slowly you can say what you like and it will be all the same as if you said nothing ah i've seen these affairs i've seen them forty years ago they drove us out of the manager's house and with sabres too now they may receive you perhaps but they won't answer you any more than that wall lord they have money why should they care there was silence again maheu and etienne rose and left the family in gloom before the empty plates on going out they called for perron and levaque and then all four went to rosseneur's where the delegates from the neighbouring settlements were arriving in little groups when the twenty members of the deputation had assembled there they settled on the terms to be opposed to the companies and then set out for montsou the keen northeast wind was sweeping the street as they arrived it struck two at first the servant told them to wait and shut the door on them then when he came back he introduced them into the drawing-room and opened the curtains a soft daylight entered sifted through the lace and the miners when left alone in their embarrassment did not care to sit all of them very clean dressed in cloth shaven that morning with their yellow hair and moustaches they twisted their caps between their fingers and looked sideways at the furniture which was in every variety of style as a result of the taste for the old-fashioned henry the second easy chairs louis fifteenth chairs an italian cabinet of the seventeenth century a spanish contador of the fifteenth century with an altar front serving as a chimney-piece and ancient chasuble trimming reapplied to the curtains 
this old gold and these old silks with their tawny tones all this luxurious church furniture had overwhelmed them with respectful discomfort the eastern carpets with their long wool seemed to bind their feet but what especially suffocated them was the heat heat like that of a hot air stove which surprised them as they felt it with cheeks frozen from the wind of the road five minutes passed by and their awkwardness increased in the comfort of this rich room so pleasantly warm at last m hennebeau entered buttoned up in a military manner and wearing on his frock coat the correct little bow of his decoration he spoke first ah here you are you are in rebellion it seems he interrupted himself to add with polite stiffness sit down i desire nothing better than to talk things over the miners turned round looking for seats a few of them ventured to place themselves in chairs while the others disturbed by the embroidered silks preferred to remain standing there was a period of silence m hombo who had drawn his easy-chair up to the fireplace was rapidly looking them over and endeavouring to recall their faces he had recognised perron it was hidden in the last row and his eyes rested on etienne who was seated in front of him well he asked what have you to say to me he had expected to hear the young man speak and he was so surprised to see maheu come forward that he could not avoid adding what you a good workman who have always been so sensible one of the old Monsu people whose family has worked in the mine since the first stroke of the axe ah it's a pity i'm sorry that you are at the head of the discontented maheu listened with his eyes down then he began at first in a low and hesitating voice it is just because i am a quiet man sir whom no one has anything against that my mates have chosen me that ought to show you that it isn't just a rebellion of blusterers badly disposed men who want to create disorder we only want justice we are tired of starving and it seems to us that the time has come when things ought to be arranged so that we can at least have bread every day his voice grew stronger he lifted his eyes and went on while looking at the manager you know quite well that we cannot agree to your new system they accuse us of bad tempering it's true we don't give the necessary time to the work but if we gave it our day's work would be still smaller and as it doesn't give us enough food at present that would mean the end of everything the sweep of the clout that would wipe off all your men pay us more and we will timber better we will give the necessary hours to the timbering instead of putting all our strength into the picking which is the only work that pays there's no other arrangement possible if the work is to be done it must be paid for and what have you invented instead a thing which we can't get into our heads don't you see you lower the price of the tram and then you pretend to make up for it by paying for all timbering separately if that was true we should be robbed all the same for the timbering would still take us more time but what makes us mad is that it isn't even true the company compensates for nothing at all it simply puts two centimes a tram into its pocket that's all yes yes that's it murmured the other deputies noticing m hombeau make a violent movement as if to interrupt but maheu cut the manager short now that he had set out his words came by themselves at times he listened to himself with surprise as though a stranger were speaking within him it was the things amassed within his breast things he did not even know were there and which came out in an expansion of his heart he described the wretchedness that was common to all of them the hard toil the brutal life the wife and little ones crying from hunger in the house he quoted the recent disastrous payments the absurd fortnightly wages eaten up by fines and rest days and brought back to their families in tears was it resolved to destroy them then sir he concluded we have come to tell you that if we've got to starve we would rather starve doing nothing it would be a little less trouble we have left the pits and we don't go down again unless the company agrees to our terms the company wants to lower the price of the tram and to pay for the tempering separately 
we asked for things to be left as they were and we also asked for five centimes more the tram now it is for you to see if you are on the side of justice and work voices rose among the miners that's it he has said what we all feel we only ask what's reason others without speaking showed their approval by nodding their heads the luxurious room had disappeared with its gold and its embroideries its mysterious piling up of ancient things and they no longer even felt the carpet which they crushed beneath their heavy boots let me reply then at last exclaimed m Hanvaux, who was growing angry first of all it is not true that the company gains two centimes the tram let us look at the figures a confused discussion followed the manager trying to divide them appealed to perron who hid himself stammering levaque on the contrary was at the head of the more aggressive muddling up things and affirming facts of which he was ignorant the loud murmurs of their voices were stifled beneath the hangings in this hot-house atmosphere if you all talk at the same time said monsieur hanbeau we shall never come to an understanding he had regained his calmness the rough politeness without bitterness of an agent who has received his instructions and means that they shall be respected from the first word he never took his eye off etienne and manoeuvred to draw the young man out of his obstinate silence leaving the discussion about the two centimes he suddenly enlarged the question no acknowledge the truth you are yielding to abominable incitations it is a plague which is now blowing over the workers everywhere and corrupting the best oh i have no need for any one to confess i can see well that you have been changed you who used to be so quiet is it not so you have been promised more butter than bread and you have been told that now your turn has come to be masters in fact you have been enrolled in that famous international that army of brigands who dream of destroying society then etienne interrupted him you are mistaken sir not a single monceau collier has yet enrolled but if they are driven to it all the pits will enroll themselves that depends on the company from that moment the struggle went on between m hanbeau and etienne as though the other miners were no longer there the company is a providence for the men and you are wrong to threaten it this year it has spent three hundred thousand francs in building settlements which only return two per cent and i say nothing of the pensions which it pays nor of the coals and medicines which it gives you who seem to be intelligent and who have become in a few months one of our most skilful workmen would it not be better if you were to spread these truths rather than ruin yourself by associating with people of bad reputation yes i mean rasseneur whom we had to turn off in order to save our pits from socialistic corruption you are constantly seen with him and it is certainly he who has induced you to form this provident fund which we would willingly tolerate if it were merely a means of saving but which we feel to be a weapon turned against us a reserve fund to pay the expenses of the war and in this connection i ought to add that the company means to control that fund etienne allowed him to continue fixing his eyes on him while a slight nervous quiver moved his lips he smiled at the last remark and simply replied then that is a new demand for until now sir you have neglected to claim that control unfortunately we wish the company to occupy itself less with us and instead of playing the part of providence to be merely just with us giving us our due the profits which it appropriates is it honest whenever a crisis comes to leave the workers to die with hunger in order to save the shareholders dividends whatever you may say sir the new system is a disguised reduction of wages and that is what we are rebelling against for if the company wants to economize it acts very badly by only economizing on the men ah there we are cried m hanbeau i was expecting that the accusation of starving the people and living by their sweat how can you talk such folly 
you who ought to know the enormous risks which capital runs in industry in the mines for example a well-equipped pit to-day costs from fifteen hundred thousand francs to two millions and it is difficult enough to get a moderate interest on the vast sum that is thus swallowed nearly half the mining companies in france are bankrupt besides it is stupid to accuse those who succeed of cruelty when their workers suffer they suffer themselves can you believe that the company has not as much to lose as you have in the present crisis it does not govern wages it obeys competition under pain of ruin blame the facts not the company but you don't wish to hear you don't wish to understand yes said the young man we understand very well that our lot will never be bettered as long as things go on as they are going and that is the reason why some day or another the workers will end by arranging that things shall go differently this sentence so moderate in form was pronounced in a low voice but with such conviction tremulous in its menace that a deep silence followed a certain constraint a breath of fear passed through the polite drawing-room the other delegates though scarcely understanding felt that their comrade had been demanding their share of this comfort and they began to cast sidelong looks over the warm hangings the comfortable seats all this luxury of which the least knick-knack would have bought them soup for a month at last m humboldt who had remained thoughtful rose as a sign for them to depart all imitated him etienne had lightly pushed maheu's elbow and the latter his tongue once more thick and awkward again spoke then sir that is all that you reply we must tell the others that you reject our terms i my good fellow exclaimed the manager i reject nothing i am paid just as you are i have no more power in the matter than the smallest of your trammers i receive my orders and my only duty is to see that they are executed i have told you what i thought i ought to tell you but it is not for me to decide you have brought me your demands i will make them known to the directors then i will tell you their reply he spoke with the correct air of a high official avoiding any passionate interest in the matter with the courteous dryness of a simple instrument of authority and the miners now looked at him with distrust asking themselves what interest he might have in lying and what he would get by thus putting himself between them and the real masters a schemer perhaps this man who was paid like a worker and who lived so well etienne ventured to intervene again you see sir how unfortunate it is that we cannot plead our cause in person we could explain many things and bring forward many reasons of which you could know nothing if we only knew where we ought to go m Renfaux was not at all angry he even smiled ah it gets complicated as soon as you have no confidence in me you will have to go over there the delegates had followed the vague gesture of his hand toward one of the windows where was it over there paris no doubt but they did not know exactly it seemed to fall back into a terrible distance in an inaccessible religious country where an unknown god sat on his throne crouching down at the far end of his tabernacle they would never see him they only felt him as a force far off which weighed on the ten thousand colliers of Monceau. and when the director spoke he had that hidden force behind him delivering oracles they were overwhelmed with discouragement etienne himself signified by a shrug of the shoulders that it would be best to go while monsieur Annabel touched maheu's arm in a friendly way and asked after jeanlin that is a severe lesson now and it is you who defend bad timbering you must reflect my friends you must realize that a strike would be a disaster for everybody before a week you would die of hunger what would you do i count on your good sense anyhow and i am convinced that you will go down on monday at the latest they all loved going out of the drawing-room with the tramping of a flock and rounded backs without replying a word to this hope of submission the manager who accompanied them was obliged to continue the conversation the company on the one side had its new tariff 
the workers on the other their demand for an increase of five centimes the tram in order that they might have no illusions he felt he ought to warn them that their terms would certainly be rejected by the directors reflect before committing any follies he repeated disturbed at their silence in the porch pierron bowed very low while levaque pretended to adjust his cap maheu was trying to find something to say before leaving when etienne again touched his elbow and they all left in the midst of this threatening silence the door closed with a loud bang when monsieur hambeau re-entered the dining-room he found his guests motionless and silent before the liqueurs in two words he told his story to Danilo, whose face grew still more gloomy then as he drank his cold coffee they tried to speak of other things but the grégoires themselves returned to the subject of the strike expressing their astonishment that no laws existed to prevent workmen from leaving their work paul reassured cecile stating that they were expecting the police at last madame hanbeau called the servant hippolyte before we go into the drawing-room just open the windows and let in a little air End of section eighteen section nineteen of germanon by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt berard part four chapter three a fortnight had passed and on the monday of the third week the list sent up to the manager showed a fresh decrease in the number of the miners who had gone down it was expected that on that morning work would be resumed but the obstinacy of the directors in not yielding exasperated the miners the voreux crecourt miro and madeleine were not the only pits resting at the victoire and at feutre cantel only about a quarter of the men had gone down even st thomas was affected the strike was gradually becoming general at the voreux a heavy silence hung over the pit mouth it was a dead workshop these great empty abandoned yards where work was leaping in the grey december sky along the high foot-bridges three or four empty trams bore witness to the mute sadness of things underneath between the slender posts of the platforms the stock of coal was diminishing leaving the earth bare and black while the supplies of wood were mouldering beneath the rain at the quay on the canal a barge was moored half laden lying drowsily in the murky water and on the deserted pit bank in which the decomposed sulphates smoked in spite of the rain a melancholy cart showed its shafts erect but the buildings especially were growing torpid the screening shed with closed shutters the steeple in which the rumbling of the receiving room no more arose and the machine-room grown cold and the giant chimney too large for the occasional smoke the winding engine was only heated in the morning the groom sent down fodder for the horses and the captains worked alone at the bottom having become labourers again watching over the damages that took place in the passages as soon as they ceased to be repaired then after nine o'clock the rest of the service was carried on by the ladders and about these dead buildings buried in their garment of black dust there was only heard the escapement of the pumping engine breathing with its thick long breath all that was left of the life of the pit which the water would destroy if that breathing should cease on the plain opposite the settlement of the deux cents coirons seemed also to be dead the prefect of lille had come in haste and the police had tramped all the roads but in face of the calmness of the strikers prefect and police had decided to go home again never had the settlement given so splendid an example in the vast plain the men to avoid going to the public house slept all day long the women while dividing the coffee became reasonable less anxious to gossip and quarrel and even the troops of children seemed to understand it all and were so good that they ran about with naked feet smacking each other silently 
the word of command had been repeated and circulated from mouth to mouth they wished to be sensible there was however a continuous coming and going of people in the maheu's house etienne as secretary had divided the three thousand francs of the provident fund among the needy families afterwards from various sides several hundred francs had arrived yielded by subscriptions and collections but now all their resources were exhausted the miners had no more money to keep up the strike and hunger was there threatening them maigret after having promised credit for a fortnight had suddenly altered his mind at the end of a week and cut off provisions he usually took his orders from the company perhaps the latter wished to bring the matter to an end by starving the settlements he acted besides like a capricious tyrant giving or refusing bread according to the look of the girl who was sent by her parents for provisions and he especially closed his doors spitefully to Mehude, wishing to punish her because he had not been able to get catherine to complete their misery it was freezing very hard and the women watched their piles of coal diminish thinking anxiously that they could no longer renew them at the pits now that the men were not going down it was not enough to die of hunger they must also die of cold among the Mehus, everything was already running short the levants could still eat on the strength of a twenty-franc piece lent by Bottoloup. as to the perrons they always had money but in order to appear as needy as the others for fear of loans they got their supplies on credit from maigrat who would have thrown his shop at perron if she had held out her petticoat to him since saturday many families had gone to bed without supper and in face of the terrible days that were beginning not a complaint was heard all obeyed the word of command with quiet courage there was an absolute confidence in spite of everything a religious faith the blind gift of a population of believers since an era of justice had been promised to them they were willing to suffer for the conquest of universal happiness hunger exalted their heads never had the low horizon opened a larger beyond to these people in the hallucination of their misery they saw again over there when their eyes were dimmed by weakness the ideal city of their dream but now growing near and seeming to be real with its population of brothers its golden age of labor and meals in common nothing overcame their conviction that they were at last entering it the fund was exhausted the company would not yield every day must aggravate the situation and they preserved their hope and showed a smiling contempt for facts if the earth opened beneath them a miracle would save them this faith replaced bread and warmed their stomachs when the Mehus and the others had too quickly digested their soup made with clear water they thus rose into a state of semi-vertigo that ecstasy of a better life which has flung martyrs to the wild beasts etienne was henceforth the unquestioned leader in the evening conversations he gave forth oracles in the degree to which study had refined him and made him able to enter into difficult matters he spent the nights reading and received a large number of letters he even subscribed to the Vengeur, a belgian socialist paper and this journal the first to enter the settlement gained for him extraordinary consideration among his mates his growing popularity excited him more every day to carry on an extensive correspondence to discuss the fate of the workers in the four corners of the province to give advice to the voreux miners especially to become a centre and to feel the world rolling round him continually swelled the vanity of the former engine man the pikeman with greasy black hands he was climbing a ladder he was entering this execrated middle class with a satisfaction to his intelligence and comfort which he did not confess to himself he had only one trouble the consciousness of his lack of education which made him embarrassed and timid as soon as he was in the presence of a gentleman in a frock coat if he went on instructing himself devouring everything the lack of method would render assimilation very slow and would produce such confusion that at last he would know much more than he could understand 
so at certain hours of good sense he experienced a restlessness with regard to his mission a fear that he was not the man for the task perhaps it required a lawyer a learned man able to speak and act without compromising the mates but an outcry soon restored his assurance no 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 lawyers they are all rascals they profit by their knowledge to fatten on the people let things turn out how they will the workers must manage their own affairs and his dream of popular leadership again soothed him Monceau at his feet paris in the misty distance who knows the election some day the tribune in a gorgeous hall where he could thunder against the middle class in the first speech pronounced by a workman in a parliament during the last few days etienne had been perplexed Fluchard wrote letter after letter offering to come to monceau to quicken the zeal of the strikers it was a question of organizing a private meeting over which the mechanic would preside and beneath this plan lay the idea of exploiting the strike to gain over to the international these miners who so far had shown themselves suspicious etienne feared a disturbance but he would however have allowed le Sharp to come if rasseneur had not violently blamed this proceeding in spite of his power the young man had to reckon with the innkeeper whose services were of older date and who had faithful followers among his clients so he still hesitated not knowing what to reply on this very monday towards four o'clock a new letter came from lille as etienne was alone with maheude in the lower room maheude weary of idleness had gone fishing if he had the luck to catch a fine fish under the sluice of the canal they could sell it to buy bread old bonnemort and little jeanlin had just gone off to try their legs which were now restored while the children had departed with elzir who spent hours on the pit bank collecting cinders seated near the miserable fire which they no longer dared to keep up maheude with her dress unbuttoned and one breast hanging out of her dress and, and falling to her belly was suckling estelle when the young man had folded the letter she questioned him is the news good are they going to send us any money he shook his head and she went on i don't know what we shall do this week however we'll hold on all the same when one has right on one side don't you think it gives you heart and one ends always by being the strongest at the present time she was to a reasonable extent in favour of the strike it would have been better to force the company to be just without leaving off work but since they had left it they ought not to go back to it without obtaining justice on this point she was relentless better to die than to show oneself in the wrong when one was right ah exclaimed etienne if a fine old cholera was to break out that would free us of all these company exploiters no no she replied we must not wish any one dead that wouldn't help us at all plenty more would spring up now i only ask that they should get sensible ideas and i expect they will for there are worthy people everywhere you know i'm not at all for your politics in fact she always blamed his violent language and thought him aggressive it was good that they should want their work paid for at what it was worth but why occupy oneself with such things as the bourgeois and government why mix oneself up with other people's affairs when one would get nothing out of it but hard knocks and she kept her esteem for him because he did not get drunk and regularly paid his forty-five francs for board and lodging when a man behaves well one can forgive him the rest etienne then talked about the republic which would give bread to everybody but maheude shook her head for she remembered eighteen forty eight an awful year which had left them as bare as worms her and her man in their early housekeeping years she forgot herself in describing its horrors in a mournful voice her eyes lost in space her breast open while her infant estelle without letting it go had fallen asleep on her knees and at the end also absorbed in thought had his eyes fixed on this enormous breast 
of which the soft whiteness contrasted with the muddy yellowish complexion of her face not a farthing she murmured nothing to put between one's teeth and all the pits stopped just the same destruction of poor people as to-day but at that moment the door opened and they remained mute with surprise before catherine who then came in since her fight with chaval she had not reappeared at the settlement her emotion was so great that trembling and silent she forgot to shut the door she expected to find her mother alone and the sight of the young man put out of her head the phrases she had prepared on the way what on earth have you come here for cried maheude without even moving from her chair i don't want to have anything more to do with you get along then catherine tried to find words mother it's some coffee and sugar yes for the children i've been thinking of them and done overtime she drew out of her pockets a pound of coffee and a pound of sugar and took courage to place them on the table the strike of the voreau troubled her while she was working at jean bart and she had only been able to think of this way of helping her parents a little under the pretext of caring for the little ones but her good nature did not disarm her mother who replied instead of bringing us sweets you would have done better to stay and earn bread for us she overwhelmed her with abuse relieving herself by throwing in her daughter's face all that she had been saying against her for the past month to go off with the man to hang on to him at sixteen when the family was in want only the most degraded of unnatural children could do it one could forgive a folly but a mother never forgot a trick like that there might have been some excuse if they had been strict with her not at all she was as free as air and they only asked her to come in to sleep tell me what have you got in your skin at your age catherine standing beside the table listened with lowered head a quiver shook her thin underdeveloped girlish body and she tried to reply in broken words oh if it was only me and the amusement that i get it's him what he wants i'm obliged to want too aren't i because you see he's the strongest how can one tell how things are going to turn out anyhow it's done and can't be undone it may as well be him as another now he'll have to marry me she defended herself without a struggle with the passive resignation of a girl who has submitted to the male in an early age was it not the common lot she had never dreamed of anything else violence behind the pick bank a child of sixteen and then a wretched household if her lover married her and she did not blush with shame she only quivered like this at being treated like a slut before this lad whose presence oppressed her to despair etienne had risen however and was pretending to stir up the nearly extinct fire in order not to interrupt the explanation but their looks met he found her pale and exhausted pretty indeed with her clear eyes in the face which had grown tanned and he experienced a singular feeling his spite had vanished he simply desired that she should be happy with this man whom she had preferred to him he felt the need to occupy himself with her still a longing to go to monceau and force the other man to his duty but she only saw pity in his constant tenderness he must feel contempt for her to gaze at her like that then her heart contracted so that she choked without being able to stammer any more words of excuse that's it you'd best hold your tongue began the implacable maheude if you come back to stay come in else get along with you at once and think yourself lucky that i'm not free just now or i should have put my foot into you somewhere for now as if this threat had suddenly been realized catherine received a vigorous kick right behind so violent that she was stupefied with surprise and pain it was chaval who had leapt in through the open door to give her this lunge of a vicious beast for a moment he had watched her from outside ah slut he yelled i've followed you i knew well enough you were coming back here to get him to fill you and it's you that pay him eh you pour coffee down him with my money 
maheude and Matienne were stupefied and did not stir with a furious movement chaval chased catherine towards the door out you go by god and as she took refuge in a corner he turned on her mother a nice business keeping watch while your whore of a daughter is kicking her legs upstairs at last he caught catherine's wrist shaking her and dragging her out at the door he again turned towards maheude who was nailed to her chair she had forgotten to fasten up her breast estelle had gone to sleep and her face had slipped down into the woollen petticoat the enormous breast was hanging free and naked like the udder of a great cow when the daughter is not at it it's the mother who gets herself plugged cried chaval go on show him your meat he isn't disgusted your dirty lodger at this at the end was about to strike his mate the fear of arousing the settlement by a fight had kept him back from snatching catherine from chaval's hands but rage was now carrying him away and the two men were face to face with inflamed eyes it was an old hatred a jealousy long unacknowledged which was breaking out one of them now must do for the other take care stammered etienne with clenched teeth i'll do for you try replied chaval they looked at one another for some seconds longer so close that their hot breaths burnt each other's faces and it was catherine who suppliantly took her lover's hand again to lead him away she dragged him out of the settlement fleeing without turning her head what a brute muttered etienne banging the door and so shaken by anger that he was obliged to sit down maheude in front of him had not stirred she made a vague gesture and there was silence a silence which was painful and heavy with unspoken things in spite of an effort his gaze again returned to her breast that expanse of white flesh the brilliance of which now made him uncomfortable no doubt she was forty and had lost her shape like a good female who had produced too much but many would still desire her strong and solid with a large long face of a woman who had once been beautiful slowly and quietly she was putting back her breast with both hands a rosy corner was still obstinate and she pushed it back with her finger and then buttoned herself up and was now quite black and shapeless in her old gown he's a filthy beast she said at last only a filthy beast could have such nasty ideas i don't care a hang what he says it isn't worth notice then in a frank voice she added fixing her eyes on the young man i have my faults sure enough but not that one only two men have touched me a putter long ago when i was fifteen and then Mahim. if he had left me like the other lord i don't quite know what would have happened and i don't pride myself either on my good conduct with him since our marriage because when one hasn't gone wrong it's often because one hasn't the chance only i say things as they are and i know neighbors who couldn't say as much don't you think that's true enough replied etienne and he rose and went out while she decided to light the fire again after having placed the sleeping estelle on two chairs if the father caught and sold a fish they could manage to have some soup outside night was already coming on a frosty night and with lowered head etienne walked along sunk in dark melancholy it was no longer anger against the man or pity for the poor ill-treated girl the brutal scene was effaced and lost and he was thrown back on to the sufferings of all the abominations of wretchedness he thought of the settlement without bread these women and little ones who would not eat that evening all this struggling race with empty bellies and the doubt which sometimes touched him awoke again in the frightful melancholy of the twilight and tortured him with a discomfort which he had never felt so strongly before with what a terrible responsibility he had burdened himself must he still push them on in obstinate resistance now that there was neither money nor credit and what would be the end of it all if no help arrived and starvation came to beat down their courage 
he had a sudden vision of disaster of dying children and sobbing mothers while the men lean and pale went down once more into the pits he went on walking his feet stumbling against the stones and the thought that the company would be found strongest and that he would have brought misfortune on his comrades filled him with insupportable anguish when he raised his head he saw that he was in front of the bureau the gloomy mass of buildings looked sombre beneath the growing darkness the deserted square obstructed by great motionless shadows seemed like the corner of an abandoned fortress as soon as the winding engine stopped the soul left the place at this hour of the night nothing was alive not a lantern not a voice and the sound of the pump itself was only a distant moan coming one could not say whence in this annihilation of the whole pit as etienne gazed the blood flowed back to his heart if the workers were suffering hunger the company was encroaching on its millions why should it prove the stronger in this war of labor against gold in any case the victory would cost it dear they would have their corpses to count he felt the fury of battle again the fierce desire to have done with misery even at the price of death it would be as well for the settlement to die at one stroke as to go on dying in detail of famine and injustice his ill-digested reading came back to him examples of nations who had burnt their towns to arrest the enemy vague histories of mothers who had saved their children from slavery by crushing their heads against the pavement of men who had died of want rather than eat the bread of tyrants his head became exalted a red gaiety arose out of his crisis of black sadness chasing away doubt and making him ashamed of this passing cowardice of an hour and in this revival of his faith gusts of pride reappeared and carried him still higher the joy of being leader of seeing himself obeyed even to sacrifice the enlarged dream of his power the evening of triumph already he imagined a scene of simple grandeur his refusal of power authority placed in the hands of the people when it would be master but he awoke and started at the voice of Mahieu, who was narrating his luck, a superb trout which he had fished up and sold for three francs. They would have their soup. Then he left his mate to return alone to the settlement, saying that he would follow him, and he entered and sat down in the advantage, awaiting the departure of a client to tell Rasseneur decisively that he should write to Pluchart to come at once. His resolution was taken. He would organize a private meeting, for victory seemed to him certain if the Monceau colliers adhered in a mass to the international end of section nineteen section twenty of germanon by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part four chapter four it was at the bon joyeux widow desires that the private meeting was organized for thursday at two o'clock the widow incensed at the miseries inflicted on her children the colliers was in a constant state of anger especially as her end was emptying never had there been a less thirsty strike the drunkards had shut themselves up at home for fear of disobeying the sober word of command thus Monceau, which swarmed with people on feast days now exhibited its wide street in mute and melancholy desolation no beer flowed from counters or bellies the gutters were dry on the pavement at the casimir bar and the estaminet du progrès one only saw the pale faces of the landladies looking inquiringly into the street then in monceau itself the deserted doors extended from the estaminet l'enfant to the estaminet tisson passing by the estaminet piquet and the tete coupe bar only the estaminet saint eloi which was frequented by captains still drew occasional glasses the solitude even extended to the volcan 
where the ladies were resting for lack of admirers although they had lowered their price from ten sous to five in view of the hard times a deep mourning was breaking the heart of the entire country by god exclaimed Wilde Désert, slapping her thighs with both hands it's the fault of the gendarmes let them run me in devil take them if they like but i must plague them for her all authorities and masters were gendarmes it was a term of general contempt in which she enveloped all enemies of the people she had greeted etienne's request with transport her whole house belonged to the miners she would lend her ballroom gratuitously and would herself issue the invitation since the law required it besides if the law was not pleased so much the better she would give them a bit of her mind since yesterday the young man had brought her some fifty letters to sign he had them copied by neighbors in the settlement who knew how to write and these letters were sent around among the pits to delegates and to men of whom they were sure the avowed order of the day was a discussion regarding the continuation of the strike but in reality they were expecting pluchart and reckoning on a discourse from him which would cause a general adhesion to the international on thursday morning etienne was disquieted by the non-appearance of his old foreman who had promised by letter to arrive on wednesday evening what then was happening he was annoyed that he would not be able to come to an understanding with him before the meeting at nine o'clock he went to Monceau with the idea that the mechanic had perhaps gone there direct without stopping at the bureau no i have not seen your friend replied widow Desire, but everything is ready come and see she led him into the ballroom the decorations were the same the garlands which supported at the ceiling a crown of painted paper flowers and the gilt cardboard shields in a line along the wall with the names of saints male and female only the musician's platform had been replaced by a table and three chairs in one corner and the room was furnished with forms ranged along the floor it's perfect etienne declared and you know said the widow that you're at home here yell as much as you like the gendarmes will have to pass over my body if they do come in spite of his anxiety he could not help smiling when he looked at her so vast did she appear with a pair of breasts so huge that one alone would require a man to embrace it which now led to the saying that of her six weekday lovers she had to take two every evening on account of the work but etienne was astonished to see rasseneur and savarine enter and as the widow left them all three in the large empty hall he exclaimed what you here already savarine who had worked all night at the bureau the engine men not being on strike had merely come out of curiosity as to rasseneur he had seemed constrained during the last two days and his fat round face had lost its good-natured laugh Luchard has not arrived and i am very anxious added etienne the innkeeper turned away his eyes and replied between his teeth i am not surprised i don't expect him What? then he made up his mind and looking the other man in the face bravely i too have sent him a letter if you want me to tell you and in that letter i have begged him not to come yes i think we ought to manage our own affairs ourselves without turning to strangers etienne losing his self-possession and trembling with anger turned his eyes on his mates and stammered you've done that you've done that i have done that certainly and you know that i trust Blachard. he's a knowing fellow and reliable one can get on with him but you see i don't care a damn for your ideas i don't politics government and all that i don't care a damn for it what i want is for the miner to be better treated i have worked down below for twenty years i've sweated down there with fatigue and misery and i've sworn to make it easier for the poor beggars who are there still and i know well enough you'll never get anything with all your ideas you'll only make the men's fate more miserable still when they are forced by hunger to go down again they will be more crushed than ever 
the company will pay them with strokes of the stick like a runaway dog who was brought back to his kennel that's what i want to prevent do you see he raised his voice protruding his belly and squarely planted on his big legs the man's whole patient reasonable nature was revealed in clear phrases which flowed abundantly without an effort was it not absurd to believe that with one stroke one could change the world putting the workers in the place of the masters and dividing gold as one divides an apple it would perhaps take thousands and thousands of years for that to be realized there hold your tongue with your miracles the most sensible plan was if one did not wish to break one's nose to go straight forward to demand possible reforms in short to improve the lot of the workers on every occasion he did his best so far as he occupied himself with it to bring the company to better terms if not damn it all they would only start by being obstinate etienne had let him speak his own speech cut short by indignation then he cried haven't you got any blood in your veins by god at one moment he would have struck him and to resist the temptation he rushed about the hall with long strides venting his fury on the benches through which he made a passage shut the door at all events souverain remarked there is no need to be heard having himself gone to shut it he quietly sat down in one of the office chairs he had rolled a cigarette and was looking at the other two men with his mild subtle eye his lips drawn by a slight smile you won't get any farther by being angry said rasseneur judiciously i believed at first that you had good sense it was sensible to recommend calmness to the mates to force them to keep indoors and to use your power to maintain order and now you want to get them into a mess at each turn in his walks among the benches etienne returned towards the innkeeper seizing him by the shoulders shaking him and shouting out his replies in his face but blast it all i mean to be calm yes i have imposed order on them yes i do advise them still not to stir only it doesn't do to be made a joke of after all you are lucky to remain cool now there are hours when i feel that i am losing my head this was a confession on his part he railed at his illusions of a novice his religious dream of a city in which justice would soon reign among the men who had become brothers a fine method truly to cross one's arms and wait if one wished to see a man eating each other to the end of the world like wolves no one must interfere or injustice would be eternal and the rich would forever suck the blood of the poor therefore he could not forgive himself the stupidity of having said formerly that politics ought to be banished from the social question he knew nothing then now he had read and studied his ideas were ripe and he boasted that he had a system he explained it badly however in confused phrases which contained a little of all the theories he had successively passed through and abandoned at the summit karl marx's idea remained standing capital was the result of spoliation it was the duty and the privilege of labor to reconquer that stolen wealth in practice he had at first with proton been captured by the chimera of a mutual credit a vast bank of exchange which suppressed middlemen then la salle's cooperative societies endowed by the state gradually transforming the earth into a single industrial town had aroused his enthusiasm until he grew disgusted in face of the difficulty of controlling them and he had arrived recently at collectivism demanding that all the instruments of production should be restored to the community but this remained vague he knew not how to realize this new dream still hindered by scruples of reason and good sense not daring to risk the secretary's absolute affirmations he simply said that it was a question of getting possession of the government first of all afterwards they would see but what has taken you why are you going over to the bourgeois he continued violently again planting himself before the innkeeper you said yourself it would have to burst up rasseneur blushed slightly yes i said so and if it does burst up 
you will see that i am no more of a coward than any one else only i refuse to be among those who increase the mess in order to fish out a position for themselves etienne blushed in his turn the two men no longer shouted having become bitter and spiteful conquered by the coldness of their rivalry it was at bottom that which always strained systems making one man revolutionary in the extreme pushing the other to an affectation of prudence carrying them in spite of themselves beyond their true ideas into those fatal parts which men do not choose for themselves and souverain who was listening exhibited on his pale girlish face a silent contempt the crushing contempt of the man who was willing to yield his life in obscurity without even gaining the splendour of martyrdom then it's to me that you're saying that asked etienne you're jealous jealous of what replied rasseneur i don't pose as a big man i'm not trying to create a section at montsou for the sake of being made secretary the other man wanted to interrupt him but he added why don't you be frank you don't care a damn for the international you're only burning to be at our head the gentleman who corresponds with the famous federal council of the nord there was silence at the end replied quivering good i don't think i have anything to reproach myself with i always asked your advice for i knew that you had fought here long before me but since you can't endure any one by your side i'll act alone in future and first i warn you that the meeting will take place even if pluchart does not come and the mates will join in spite of you oh join muttered the innkeeper that's not enough you'll have to get them to pay their subscriptions not at all the international grants time to workers on strike it will at once come to our help and we shall pay later on rustner was carried beyond himself well we shall see i belong to this meeting of yours and i shall speak i shall not let you turn our friends heads i shall let them know where their real interests lie we shall see whom they mean to follow me whom they have known for thirty years or you who have turned everything upside down among us in less than a year no no damn it all we shall see which of us is going to crush the other and he went out banging the door the garlands of flowers swayed from the ceiling and the gilt shields jumped against the walls then the great room fell back into its heavy calm souverain was smoking in his quiet way seated before the table after having paced for a moment in silence etienne began to relieve his feelings at length was it his fault if they had left that fat lazy fellow to come to him and he defended himself from having popularity he knew not even how it had happened this friendliness of the settlement the confidence of the miners the power which he now had over them he was indignant at being accused of wishing to bring everything to confusion out of ambition he struck his chest protesting his brotherly feelings suddenly he stopped before souverain and exclaimed do you know if i thought i should cost a drop of blood to a friend i would go off at once to america the engine man shrugged his shoulders and a smile again came on his lips oh blood he murmured what does that matter the earth has need of it etienne grown calm took a chair and put his elbows on the other side of the table this fair face with the dreamy eyes which sometimes grew savage with the red light disturbed him and exercised a singular power over his will in spite of his comrade's silence conquered even by that silence he felt himself gradually absorbed well he asked what would you do in my place am i not right to act as i do isn't it best for us to join this association souverain after having slowly ejected a jet of smoke replied by his favourite word oh foolery but meanwhile it's always so besides their international will soon begin to move it has taken it up who then he he had pronounced this word in a whisper with religious fervour casting a glance towards the east he was speaking of the master bakunin 
the destroyer he alone can give the thunderclap he went on while your learned men with their evolution are mere cowards before three years are past the international under his orders will crush the old world etienne pricked up his ears in attention he was burning to gain knowledge to understand this worship of destruction regarding which the engine man only uttered occasional obscure words as though he kept certain mysteries to himself well but explain to me what is your aim to destroy everything no more nations no more governments no more property no more god no worship i quite understand only what will that lead you to to the primitive formless commune to a new world to the renewal of everything and the means of execution how do you reckon to set about it by fire by poison by the dagger the brigand is the true hero the popular avenger the revolutionary in action with no phrases drawn out of books we need a series of tremendous outrages to frighten the powerful and to arouse the people as he talked souverain grew terrible an ecstasy raised him on his chair a mystic flame darted from his pale eyes and his delicate hands gripped the edge of the table almost to breaking the other man looked at him in fear and thought of the stories of which he had received vague intimation of mines charged beneath the czar's palace of chiefs of police struck down by knives like wild boars of his mistress the only woman he had loved hanged at moscow one rainy morning while in the crowd he kissed her with his eyes for the last time no no murmured etienne as with a gesture he pushed away these abominable visions we haven't got to that yet over here murder and fire never it is monstrous unjust all the mates would rise and strangle the guilty one and besides he could not understand the instincts of his race refused to accept this sombre dream of the extermination of the world mown level like a rye field then what would they do afterwards how would the nation spring up again he demanded a reply tell me your program we like to know where we are going to then souverain concluded peacefully with his gaze fixed on space all reasoning about the future is criminal because it prevents pure destruction and interferes with the progress of revolution this made etienne laugh in spite of the cold shiver which passed over his flesh besides he willingly acknowledged that there was something in these ideas which attracted him by their fearful simplicity only it would be plain into rasmus's hands if he were to repeat such things to his comrades it was necessary to be practical widow Dessir proposed that they should have lunch they agreed and went into the inn parlour which was separated from the ballroom on weekdays by a movable partition when they had finished their omelette and cheese the engine man proposed to depart and as the other tried to detain him what for to listen to you talking useless foolery i've seen enough of it good day he went on in his gentle obstinate way with a cigarette between his lips etienne's anxiety increased it was one o'clock and pluchart was decidedly breaking his promise towards half-past one the delegates began to appear and he had to receive them for he wished to see who entered for fear that the company might send its usual spies he examined every letter of invitation and took note of those who entered many came in without a letter as they were admitted provided he knew them as two o'clock struck rasseneur entered finishing his pipe at the counter and chatting without haste this provoking calmness still further disturbed etienne all the more as many had come merely for fun zacharie moquet and others these cared little about the strike and found it a great joke to do nothing seated at tables and spending their last two sous on drink they grinned and bantered their mates the serious ones who had come to make fools of themselves another quarter of an hour passed there was impatience in the hall then etienne in despair made a gesture of resolution and he decided to enter when widow Desir, who was putting her head outside exclaimed 
but here he is your gentleman it was in fact pluchart he came in a cab drawn by a broken-winded horse he jumped at once on to the pavement a thin insipidly handsome man with a large square head in his black cloth frock coat he had the sunday air of a well-to-do workman for five years he had not done a stroke with the file and he took care of his appearance especially combing his hair in a correct manner vain of his successes on the platform but his limbs were still stiff and the nails of his large hands eaten by the iron had not grown again very active he worked out his ambitions scouring the province unceasingly in order to place his ideas ah don't be angry with me he said anticipating questions and reproaches yesterday lecture at Poulilly in the morning meeting in the evening at valentquet to-day lunch at marchiennes with Savagnat. then i had to take a cab i'm worn out you can tell by my voice but that's nothing i shall speak all the same he was on the threshold of the bon joyeux when he bethought himself by jingo i'm forgetting the tickets we should have been in a fine fix he went back to the cab which the cabman drew up again and he pulled out a little black wooden box which he carried off under his arm etienne walked radiantly in his shadow while rasseneur in consternation did not dare to offer his hand but the other was already pressing it and saying a rapid word or two about the letter what a rum idea why not hold this meeting one should always hold a meeting when possible widow Tissier asked if he would take anything but he refused no need he spoke without drinking only he was in a hurry because in the evening he reckoned on pushing as far as Boiselle, where he wished to come to an understanding with les Gaujons. then they all entered the ballroom together maheu and levaque who had arrived late followed them the door was then locked in order to be in privacy this made the jokers laugh even more zacharie shouting to moquet that perhaps they were going to get them all with child in there about a hundred miners were waiting on the benches in the close air of the room with the warm odors of the last bell rising from the floor whispers ran round and all heads turned while the newcomers sat down in the empty places they gazed at the little gentleman and the black frock coat caused a certain surprise and discomfort but on etienne's proposition the meeting was at once constituted he gave out the names while the others approved by lifting their hands pluchart was nominated chairman and maheu and etienne himself were voted stewards there was a movement of chairs and the officers were installed for a moment they watched the chairman disappear beneath the table under which he slid the box which he had not let go when he reappeared he struck lightly with his fist to call for attention then he began in a hoarse voice citizens a little door opened and he had to stop it was widow Desir, who coming round by the kitchen brought in six glasses on a tray don't put yourselves out she said when one talks one gets thirsty maheu relieved her of the tray and pluchart was able to go on he said how very touched he was at his reception by the Monceau workers he excused himself for his delay mentioning his fatigue and his sore throat then he gave place to citizen rasseneur who wished to speak rasseneur had already planted himself beside the table near the glasses the back of a chair served him as a rostrum he seemed very moved and coughed before starting in a loud voice mates what gave him his influence over the workers at the pit was the facility of his speech the good-natured way in which he could go on talking to them by the hour without ever growing weary he never ventured to gesticulate but stood stolid and smiling drowning them and dazing them until they all shouted yes yes that's true enough you're right however on this day from the first word he felt that there was a sullen opposition this made him advance prudently he only discussed the continuation of the strike and waited for applause before attacking the international certainly honour prevented them from yielding to the company's demands but how much misery what a terrible future if it was necessary to persist much longer and without declaring for submission 
he damped their courage he showed them the settlements dying of hunger he asked on what resources the partisans of resistance were counting three or four friends tried to applaud him but this accentuated the cold silence of the majority and the gradually rising dis disapprobation which greeted his phrases then despairing of winning them over he was carried away by anger he foretold misfortune if they allowed their heads to be turned at the instigation of strangers two-thirds of the audience had risen indignantly trying to silence him since he insulted them by treating them like children unable to act for themselves but he went on speaking in spite of the tumult taking repeated gulps of beer and shouting violently that the man was not born who would prevent him from doing his duty pluchard had risen as he had no bell he struck his fist on the table repeating in his hoarse voice citizens citizens at last he obtained a little quiet and the meeting when consulted brought rasseneur's speech to an end the delegates who had represented the pits in the interview with the manager led the others all enraged by starvation and agitated by new ideas the voting was decided in advance you don't care a damn you don't you can eat yelled levaque thrusting out his fist at rasseneur etienne leaned over behind the chairman's back to appease maheu who was very red and carried out of himself by this hypocritical discourse citizens said pluchard allow me to speak there was deep silence he spoke his voice sounded painful and hoarse but he was used to it on his journeys and took his laryngitis about with him like his programme gradually his voice expanded and he produced pathetic effects with it with open arms and accompanying his periods with a swaying of his shoulders he had an eloquence which recalled the pulpit a religious fashion of sinking the ends of his sentences whose monotonous roll at last carried conviction his discourse centred on the greatness and the advantages of the international it was that with which he always started in every new locality he explained its aim the emancipation of the workers he showed its imposing structure below the commune higher the province still higher the nation and at the summit humanity his arms moved slowly piling up the stages preparing the immense cathedral of the future world then there was the internal administration he read the statutes spoke of the congresses pointed out the growing importance of the work the enlargement of the program which starting from the discussion of wages was now working towards a social liquidation to have done with the wage system no more nationalities the workers of the whole world would be united by a common need for justice sweeping away the middle-class corruption founding at last a free society in which he who did not work should not reap he roared his breath startled the flowers of painted paper beneath the low smoky ceiling which sent back the sound of his voice a wave passed through the audience some of them cried that's it we're with you he went on the world would be conquered before three years and he enumerated the nations already conquered from all sides adhesions were reigning in never had a young religion counted so many disciples then when they had the upper hand they would dictate terms to the masters who in their turn would have a fist at their throats yes yes they'll have to go down with a gesture he enforced silence now he was entering on the strike question in principle he disapproved of strikes it was a slow method which aggravated the sufferings of the worker but before better things arrived and when they were inevitable one must make up one's mind to them for they had the advantage of disorganizing capital and in this case he showed the international as providence for strikers and quoted examples in paris during the strike of the bronze workers the masters had granted everything at once terrified at the news that the international was sending help in london it had saved the miners at a colliery by sending back at its own expense a shipload of belgians who had been brought over by the coal owner it was sufficient to join and the companies trembled for the men entered the great army of workers who were resolved to die for one another 
rather than to remain the slaves of a capitalistic society applause interrupted him he wiped his forehead with his handkerchief at the same time refusing a glass which maheu passed to him when he was about to continue fresh applause cut short his speech it's all right he said rapidly to etienne they've had enough quick the cards he had plunged beneath the table and reappeared with the little black wooden box citizens he shouted dominating the disturbance here are the cards of membership let your delegates come up and i will give them to them to be distributed later on we can arrange everything rasseneur rushed forward and again protested at the end was also agitated having to make a speech extreme confusion followed levaque jumped up with his fists out as if to fight maheu was up and speaking but nobody could distinguish a single word in the growing tumult the dust rose from the floor a floating dust of former balls poisoning the air with a strong odour of putters and trammers suddenly the little door opened and widow Desir filled it with her belly and breast shouting in a thundering voice for god's sake silence the gendarmes it was the commissioner of the district who had arrived rather late to prepare a report and to break up the meeting four gendarmes accompanied him for five minutes the widow had delayed them at the door replying that she was at home and that she had a perfect right to entertain her friends but they had hustled her away and she had rushed in to warn her children must clear out through here she said again there's a dirty gendarme guarding the court it doesn't matter my little wood house opens into the alley quick then the commissioner was already knocking with his fists and as the door was not opened he threatened to force it a spy must have talked for he cried that the meeting was illegal a large number of miners being there without any letter of invitation in the hall the trouble was growing they could not escape thus they had not even voted either for adhesion or for the continuation of the strike all persisted in talking at the same time at last the chairman suggested a vote by acclamation arms were raised and the delegates declared hastily that they would join in the name of their absent mates and it was thus that the ten thousand colliers of monceau became members of the internationale meanwhile the retreat began in order to cover it widow Desir had propped herself up against the door which the butt-ends of the gendarmes muskets were forcing at her back the miners jumped over the benches and escaped one by one through the kitchen and the wood-yard rasseneur disappeared among the first and levaque followed him forgetful of his abuse and planning how he could get an offer of a glass to pull himself together at the end after having seized the little box waited for pluchard and Mehu, who considered it a point of honour to emerge last as they disappeared the lock gave and the commissioner found himself in the presence of the widow whose breast and belly still formed a barricade it doesn't help you much to smash everything in my house she said you can see there's nobody here the commissioner a slow man who did not care for scenes simply threatened to take her off to prison and he then went away with his four gendarmes to prepare a report beneath the jeers of zacharie and moquet who were full of admiration for the way in which their mates had humbugged this armed force for which they themselves did not care a hang in the alley outside at the end embarrassed by the box was rushing along followed by the others he suddenly thought of perron and asked why he had not turned up maheu also running replied that he was ill a convenient illness the fear of compromising himself they wished to retain pluchart but without stopping he declared that he must set out at once for Oiselle, where le Gaujou was awaiting orders then as they ran they shouted out to him their wishes for a pleasant journey and rushed through monceau with their heels in the air a few words were exchanged broken by the panting of their chests etienne and maheu were laughing confidently henceforth certain of victory when the international had sent help it would be the company that would beg them to resume work and in this burst of hope in this gallop of big boots sounding over the pavement of the streets there was something else also something sombre and fierce a gust of violence which would inflame the settlements in the four corners of the country 
End of section 20.